Hello and thank you for tuning in to the Department of Mechanical Engineering Taste Lecture session today from Imperial College London. Uh, my name is Jake and I'm from the student recruitment team and I'll be your host today and facilitating the session. So wherever you're joining us, you are all very welcome to today's lecture and if you're considering mechanical engineering as your degree subject to study at Imperial. Um, so we have our lecturer Mark, uh, will be showing you a real lecture from our so, department and who will be sort of briefly introducing what kind of mechanical engineering degree entails here at Imperial. I uh, just want to quickly introduce our professor today. So Mark, would you like to take over and introduce yourself to the audience today? Thank you, Jake. Um, yes, welcome all. Um, good afternoon from uh, the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Imperial College, or depending on where you are in the world, it could also be um, good morning or good evening, or maybe even good night. Um, my name is Mark Maasen, and I am a reader in the uh, departments. Um, so yeah, briefly about me. Um, I'm a reader in tribology and mechanical engineering design here at Imperial College. And um, mechanical engineering design is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about me as well. So I will also explain what tribology is. But um, before I start that, oh no, let's first do tribology. So, um, Tribology, just to give you a little bit of a background in what I spend most of my day with when I'm doing mechanical engineering design and tribology. Tribology is um, the science and engineering of services that rub. So basically, um, all my research and all my education is talking about services that are in contact and the friction that occurs between those services, um, where that may occur, and lubrication that um, we use to prevent friction or wear occurring. Um, I'll talk a little bit later, uh, a bit more about that later. Um, but now that you've seen who I am, I am actually quite uh, curious about who you are. So um, I wanted to do a quick Mentimeter. So if you could um, please give me some answers on who you are. So we've got about 400 people on, on this call, I understand. Um, if you could go to www.menti.com and use this code 28729540, which you can see on your screen, please type your first name. Yes, everyone. So please do uh, log on the website and type in the code and type answers. Uh, so we're going to keep the session uh, interactive. And so feel free to use the question tab to ask your questions as well and uh, there will be lots of interactive elements uh, sort of in this lecture so feel free to use this and also ask the questions and we're going to be answering some of the questions live after lecture and also our missions tutor professors from mechanical engineering are also in the background answering some of the missions related to the questions as well so do use the question tab and also mentor mentor to engage mark today uh yes um yeah, we're seeing lots of answers coming through. That's great. Um, and also, That's we do have some people joining us. <laughs> Good, yeah, the numbers are going up now quite quickly. That's fantastic. Yeah. Good. I will go back to this in a second. Um, so yeah, whilst um, people are putting in their names, um, a little bit more indeed about um, this tribology thing that I work on. Um, so as I said, it's the science and engineering of services that rub, and it's all about contact, friction, wear and lubrication. So um, in, in a traditional mechanical engineering sense, and we'll, we'll start talking a little bit more about traditional mechanical engineering and modern mechanical engineering as well. But in a traditional sense, this is all about, uh, for instance, having gears that transmit motion and then putting oil in between to make sure that that gearbox is efficient and doesn't wear too much. So that is um, basically what I work on. And the key thing or why I think that is such an interesting uh, part of mechanical engineering is that tribology is literally everywhere. It, inter it governs any interfacial behavior. So as soon as you've got two components that move against each other, um, tribology is there and we need to understand what the friction is, how the contact mechanics are. Um, and so this, this tribology 
basically determines the efficiency. You can imagine that if you have lots of friction, that the efficiency of your gearbox is low, uh, or that the performance is low. So tribology governs basically everything in engineering in terms of transport and energy, uh, but also if you start making parts, like if you make uh, car doors, for instance, and you stamp them, the friction between the car door and the uh, and the tool is uh, is very important on the product quality. And also in nature, um, the way animals move, um, the way people move, or the way the earth moves, so earthquakes and different plates, um, that's all governed by tribology. Now, my research is um, a little bit less, um, how do I call it, um, machines than that. My research is mainly in biotribology. And uh, in that case, also, biotribology is literally everywhere. So, um, from the moment you wake up and open your eyes and rub the sleep out of your eyes, um, you do something biotribology. Um, biotribology is most well known for, for things like hip implants and knee implants, but also if you shave in the morning or um, if you go mountain climbing and want to have grip between your fingers and um, a ridge, then um, friction is really important and we can develop methods to improve friction. Um, typically, we only notice this and we only start thinking about it when it starts going wrong. So when you climb that mountain and you don't have enough grip or when you get a piece of grit in your eyes and your eyes get uh, irritated or when you make a, a sliding tackle and um, the grass kind of burns and stretches away your skin. So those are all kind of things that we work on and try to improve. Um, in our research, we do all kinds of things on, on tribology. So we look at um, making chocolates um, healthier by, whilst also keeping the friction profile and the oral perception the same. We look at um, uh, haptic screens and how we can improve the touch sensation when you use your touch screen. But we also work with medics, um, working on, uh, for instance, the interface between the prosthetic or face mask and the skin and trying to improve that contact so that the skin doesn't um, get irritated when, when you use your prosthetic. And finally, an another example that we recently worked on is um, people who suffer from bruxism, so their teeth uh, wear away because they, they grind their teeth in their sleep. And we're looking at um, developing friction-reducing um, lubricants, basically, that you can put on your teeth so that um, the effects of friction are less and your, and your teeth are more uh, protected. Let's see where we are with the Mentimeter. Okay, I've got quite a few instant, uh, answers indeed at this moment. That's lovely. Um, let's do another question. Um, where in the world are you at this moment? So could you please indicate where you're dialing in from? Oh, the first one is Australia. Far away. Got some answers in the middle of the ocean, quite a few in the UK, Africa. East Asia, okay, all over the place, fantastic. Really nice to see that people are uh, joining this call from all kinds of places in the world. Good, Just keep on filling this out. I will go back to my presentation. So as I said, we only notice um, tribology basically when things go wrong, but that's kind of exciting because that means that I work with all kinds of medics and um, non-engineers solving problems that have direct impact on, on humans' life, lives. So that was tribology. I will now focus on what really is the key part of, of this talk, and that is uh, the title that I've been asked to, to give to this, uh, to this talk is Demystifying Mechanical Engineering Design. Now, I will do my best to do that, um, but I think to start demystifying, we first need to um, understand what mechanical engineering actually is. So let's have a look at that. Mechanical engineering. Um, well, I'm going to ask you again. So let's move away from where in the world are you at this moment with results, a firm biggest group in, in the UK. 
Okay, let's go to the next one. Can you put a few words in Mentimeter to explain what you think is mechanical engineering? So I see system, I see problem solving, I see production, design, creation, use of machines, all very good answers. Physics and design seem to be um, popular in the choices. Mechanics, construction. Innovation, also a good one. Um, analytical components, make things work, I like that one. Moving parts, cars, technology, creation. Yes, I think, I think we're getting there. We're having some kind of answer. Building, gears, mathematics, vehicles, energy. Um, yeah, that's kind of... Apply science into products, yes. Product movements, mechanisms, use of machine, invention. Yep. Um, so what I do when I start um, defining something, I'll leave this open anyway, is of course, step one, just open a dictionary. And if you open a dictionary, you get uh, something that says the brand of, a branch of engineering dealing with the design construction and use of machines. And I'd like to think that that's a very old fashioned 1950s way of defining mechanical engineering, particularly this machines thing, because we do so much more. But you've just seen that I do um, uh, all kinds of things with the human body. Now, you could define the human body as a machine, but I think that's not the definition of machines that they had in mind when they defined mechanical engineering as such. So. This is typically what, what people traditionally see as mechanical engineering, like bicycles, um, robots, making cars, or if you're really, really going fancy, um, space spacecraft and maybe even returning spacecraft. Um, but that's kind of the old fashioned definition. I, um, in preparation for this talk, decided to, uh, to ask some of my colleagues, and um, I got actually quite interesting different answers than this. Um, so Amy, one of my colleagues in thermofluids, said that mechanical engineering is all about using mathematics, physics, but also other subjects like chemistry, biology, computing, to improve the world around us. It's both intellectually stimulating and of real societal importance. Now, that's maybe not so much a real definition of what it exactly is, but it definitely doesn't mention machines. Um, we also have Guillermo, who's also today on the call, and he said, mechanical engineering is the mastering of motion and energy to create new devices and technologies that solve problems faced by society. Again, a, a much different definition of mechanical engineering than the textbook or the dictionary definition. And here, I think the focus is on solving problems faced by society. And the last one, um, is by Maria, another colleague of mine, um, and she says, mechanical engineering extends beyond the traditional ideas. Um, it has taken me to questions such as, how do crack, cracks form in precious painted artwork? Or how can pet foods be designed to prevent plaque accumulation? Many other fascinating questions affecting society's well-being and the UK economy. So again, no mention at all of machines, but all about solving questions, solving problems that society is facing. So next to these traditional engineering things, we do all kinds of other things. Um, our alumni have worked on, uh, for instance, what you see on the right-hand side of, of, uh, of, of, in the right bottom side of the screen, um, Lady Gaga's flying dress. You could claim that's a piece of machinery. You could also claim that's a piece of fashion. 
Um, our colleagues are also working on um, creating artificial organs. And um, again, is that a machine? Well, definitely not in the traditional sense of the word. What is key in all this is um, for our students to have a, a, a solid knowledge base. And um, well, there's no denying to that. That solid base, uh, that, that knowledge base is basically physics and mathematics. And we expect our students to be good at that from the moment of well before they basically arrive here in college. So our students are all excellent at mathematics and physics. Otherwise, you would not be um, entering college, basically. But then um, what we do with the knowledge base is we use um, mathematics and physics on our core subjects. So we teach our students things like stress analysis. Um, so basically, how do structures behave? Like uh, a bridge, how do you uh, analyze the stresses and the forces that are acting on uh, a bridge? The next step would be to start focusing on dynamics. So where the construction is not statically anymore, like a bridge, but where we have components that move relative to each other. Then we've got what I just explained, the things like tropology. But we also have um, aspects like um, the dynamic behavior. So um, forces and acceleration, and how do you deal with that? How do you keep that under control? Um, of course, all these structures are made out of materials. So we need to understand how materials behave, not just how they uh, fracture, but also how they deform and deflect when we put a load under it. Our focus is not only on solids, we also do fluid mechanics. So we, focus, we, we look at how fluids, in this case, it could be a liquid, but it could also be a gas, how that behaves and um, what kind of patterns and behavior it has under loading or under vacuum. Um, and then, of course, we combine the two in a subject like thermodynamics, where we burn gases and we need to understand how that affects the structure around it because the temperatures are getting hot, um, the, the fluids are moving and combusting and uh, could be quite damaging to the material around it as well. And in the end, of course, all of this needs to be controlled as well. So in uh, courses like control and mechatronics, we try to focus on um, how do we keep our processes under control and what can we do kind of smart things to, to make sure things don't go wrong. And around that knowledge base, um, we basically expect our students to, to use additional skills that we teach them. So we want them to be analytical um, and be able to, to calculate all these things or assess all these things. Um, but we also want them to, to be able to run computer simulations. So if you design a, a rocket ship or a spaceship, um, understanding how um, the environment flows around that spaceship. Our students need to be strong in programming and we teach them how to do that. Um, but they also need to understand how things are made. So they need to have a solid base in manufacture. And uh, in the end, what it's all about is also, of course, that the products that we make um, are not harmful for the environment. So we also perform things like life cycle analysis to make sure that what you design and what you use is not just wasted at the end, but you can reuse the materials and you can um, recycle them or at least not just dump them in the tip. Now, if you start thinking about what are um, famous engineers or famous scientists, people quickly come up with lists like uh, Leonardo da Vinci or Isaac Newton or Galilei, um, people who can be described as um, geniuses who basically went away, worked on their own and developed all kinds of theories and products. Like Leonardo da Vinci does not need any explanation, but he um, designed all kinds of helicopters and flying machines. And I'll get a little bit back to, to that later on. Um, but typically what non-engineers think is maybe um, best described by uh, the person on the right hand side in the bottom, uh, Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Uh, slightly strange person, creative genius, working in his garden shed, designing the most weird and fantastic creations. 
I like to make the point that that's absolutely not what an engineer is. An engineer is not the loner sitting in his garden shed and coming up with the smart ideas. Um, there's much more to, to engineers. Um, and a good example that I have, uh, I think, is, is Lewis, Lewis Hamilton, uh, particularly last season and the seasons before when he was highly successful. Um, when he wins a, a Grand Prix, he doesn't just celebrate on his own. The first thing he does do is he goes to his pit, team in the pits and he starts celebrating with them. Or at the end of the uh, Formula uh, of, of the weekend, you see them with the big team, the race team that's all on, on site. And actually, if you look at um, the team that is needed to run, a, um, to run two or three cars like that, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. So an engineer is not just this loner who sits in his garden shed developing all kinds of things. An engineer is a person who is part of a team working on really smart solutions to solve a problem that the rest of the team have assigned them and are depending on them to, to develop. Now, that works, of course, if you win. It also works if, if you lose. So last week or last weekend, um, things weren't going that well with Mercedes. And again, you see there that Hamilton said, we underperformed as a team. So as a team, you win and you lose. But as an engineer, you always work in this team. And it's, there are many more examples of where engineers work in a team. And another nice example is, uh, for instance, Airbus. They um, deliberately have their design and engineering teams all spread out over the world. And they even built their own planes to transport bits of plane across the world. So they make their wings, for instance, in the UK, they make their fuselages in, in Germany, and then they ship them all by plane to France, where they integrate the systems into a plane. So as an engineer you, and as an engineering designer, you will never work on your own in your garden shed. You will always be part of a big team. Um, and that, of course, means that we've got an extra shell around all the fancy things that an engineer should be able to do. An engineer should also be able to work in a team. Um, they should have a problem-solving so mindset with eye for detail, but also have strong social and interpersonal skills. They should be good at presenting. Um, they should be strong at reporting. Because you work in a team, you need to be really good at project management and timekeeping. Um, you need to be creative. You need to be able to visualize your ideas and communicate them to people around you. You need to be resilient because it's not easy to solve problems all the time. And most importantly, I think you need to be continuously curious and you need to be independent of other people in your thoughts in coming up with new things. So an engineer is much more than just this single genius working in their shed. It's basically a team player who's got an awful lot of skills and capabilities and we're all trying to train those those things to our students by running projects and going through design and application projects where core knowledge that we teach can be applied and and showcased so that gets me to the design part in mechanical engineering design and people have been asking me what what is the difference between mechanical engineering and engineering design and design engineering and I think this kind of sums it up. On the left-hand side, you've got the engineer. And when the engineer draws a Venn diagram or a circle, it's precise. It's round. The roundness is specified. We know the tolerances. We know exactly how it works. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, we've got a designer. And you ask the designer to design a Venn diagram. Most likely, it's not going to be round. It will be, there will be some kind of styling to it. Um, there will be some some curve that's not completely um, with equal line th thickness, and it will be different than what your standards expect. And that center point, that sweet spot between the two, that's where the mechanical engineer designer operates. Now, the way we do that, or the way we teach that in um, in mechanical engineering here at Imperial, is uh, by using an approach that's called the total design approach. And we start with a specification of a problem or a product and ask, can we design something for a client? Um, and once we know what we design, we go and 
develop some concepts. We come up with ideas. Once we know ideas, we can then decide on what the best idea is, and we can kind of embody that. So we can decide, okay, this is our solution, this is how we're going to, what it's going to look like, and then we say, let's build it and let's deliver it to the client, and hopefully the client is happy. I'll dive into that now a little bit more. So this specification phase, basically a client comes to you and asks you to do the mechanical design of a new mobile phone. So let's assume that the electronics and the, and the software side of things are solved or are also in the progress by, by a team that does that. But the mechanical engineer um, has to come up with the mechanical design aspects. Now we divide that into things like function, criteria, and we like to quantify that. Functions could be, for instance, you need to use the um, you need to use the, the phone, so you need to display information. Um, to use it, you need to hold it. It's a mobile phone, so you need to be able to transport it easily or store it somewhere. Um, it also needs to be protected so that when it falls, it doesn't crack the screen. And there's quite a lot of other functions that we can dive into. The key thing there is then to come up with the criteria. So for instance, for using it and for displaying it, the displaying information, it shouldn't be too small. But on the other hand, you need to hold it. It needs to fit in a hand. So it can probably also not be too large. Um, it needs to be transportable. So it should be fit in a, fitting in a, in a trouser pocket or maybe in a handbag, depending on the client. It shouldn't be too heavy. Um, it shouldn't break when falling. And those are all good criteria. But as a designer, we can't do too much with that because I don't have a clue what is not too small or not too large. So the next stage is to quantify all of those things. And that's basically where the difficulty comes in. Because everyone wants different things from their mobile phone, for instance. Now, we've got some places where we can start. So again, phones are a good example in this, in this case. So there was in the 1950s a, uh, a researcher called Henry Dreyfus who developed a book called Designing for People. It was basically based on his, um, a, a, a task that he was given to design a, a, a phone. And he started thinking about taking the phone away from what it was in the 1920s when it was a big block hanging on the wall and you had a an earpiece that you had to hold against your ear and a mouthpiece that was always at the wrong height but you had to talk into it um, and more a, a desk-based device but then he got questions like how big does the handle need to be how long does it need to be between an ear and a mouth and how is this going to work and he came up with the solution that you had to have um, an overview of the anthropometric metrics so you need to know the dimensions of people and this is still very relevant if you design your mobile phone now um, there are certain parts of the screen that you can easily reach so that's where you want to put the functions that you um, use a lot and there are also some parts of the screen that are hard to reach when you use a one-handed operation so that's where you put the functions that are not that often needed um, so this is a real key part in the design process. Why do I spend so much time on specification? Well, very often it goes wrong. This is an example from um, uh, the, the army in my home country. I'm Dutch. And um, last year, uh, they got their first new defense trucks um, um, delivered. And they, well, this news article says it all. They are a few centimeters too high. And then it says, are not allowed on the road. The problem was actually a lot bigger than not being allowed on the road. They simply didn't fit on the road. So as soon as these trucks would hit a bridge, they would literally hit it. Um, so they couldn't be moved from one side of the country to the other. Now, if you do your specification wrong, and you find that out by the time that um, the first 20 of your 500 trucks have been delivered, that's an expensive problem. It's not only the Dutch, um, the French are also good at it. Um, so a couple of years ago, they had a problem where they developed trains. And then after delivery, they realized that the trains are too wide and that at some stations, um, they would hit the platform. Again, somewhere down the line, the specification was not 
set up correctly. And as a result, there were huge costs. So specification is really important. Now, the Europeans are not the only ones who get it wrong. Uh, NASA also get it, got it terribly wrong a couple of years ago. This was uh, early 20th century, uh, 21st century. Um, they had half of the team working in um, metric units, and the other half of the team, Lockheed Martin, was working at in, in imperial units. And they only found that out when their polar lander crashed on the surface of Mars, of course, at enormous costs. And again, the specification was wrong. There should have been a specification somewhere that the entire design process should have been done in metric units. Um, but also here in London, um, the Millennium Bridge, the bridge between uh, Tate Modern and uh, St. Paul's, is, is well known for being the wobbly bridge. Because on the day that it was opened, um, they had to shut it down again because when people walked over it, the bridge started swaying. And it was actually a deliberate choice during their design process to not take this vibration into account because it was deemed too small. Now, if they had done it properly in the specification, they would have taken this into account and they wouldn't have had to spend another 20 million solving this vibration problem of the bridge. So specification often goes wrong and it's a, a part of the design process that typically engineers like to jump over as quickly as possible. But anyway, once we've defined that we, um, what we want to make, we then can start coming up with ideas um, and concepts to, to kind of come up with our ultimate design. And the way we like to do that is um, sometimes we jokingly call that the iceberg model of, of concepts and crazy ideas is um, to come up with an enormous amount of ideas. Because if you want to have one ultimate brilliant design, you probably need to come up with quite a few bad ones first. And in that, it's very important to take into account that the most obvious solution or the first one you think of is typically not the best one. So if you think about, for instance, um, a bicycle, um, a bicycle, the way it's driven is nothing more than um, the person sitting on the bicycle, moving their, their feet, or moving their legs, rotating that, and with some kind of transmission, typically the rear wheel gets driven and that creates forward motion. And the way this is typically solved is by something called a chain drive. So you've got a chain wheel or a sprocket at the front, a chain between the two, uh, you've got a chain at the back and a chain wheel, a chain in, the, in between, and that drives your entire system. But that's not the only way you can do it. There's, there's all kinds of other ways to solve this. You can have a belt drive, or you can have a, a shaft drive. Lots of motorbikes have a shaft drive. You can have a direct drive. You can, why would you need a transmission between the two? You can use gears, or you can use all kinds of weird combinations of things, like a shaft and a gear drive or maybe even um, a string drive. This, these examples were um, basically a five minute Google into um, bicycle transmissions and you get all these brilliant ideas. Now, the key idea of course is not just getting stuck in lots of ideas, but bringing your ideas towards a concept, something you can work with. So um, Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, um, wanted to develop a something to fly and his concepts were to look at how birds would fly take that into uh, a deeper analysis and come up with solutions and on one hand that's really interesting on the other hand that led him towards the path that it had to be human powered and even 400 years later people were still trying to develop human powered uh, solutions and it took the right to the right brothers brothers um, several centuries later to realize that actually probably the best way is not to make it human powered but you need some some kind of support some kind of engine to drive it in a different way of, of solving this problem in this uh, concept phase is typically when you when you start sticking to proper solutions and you start also um, to committing to cost so if you get it wrong in the concept phase you basically um, are sorting out or Basically, you're committing to enormous costs already that if you have to solve that later in the process, 
for instance, if you find out during manufacture that you made a mistake, or worse even, during delivery, you will have encountered enormous costs and you, it, it will be difficult to solve that. Now, once we've got a proper design, uh, a proper concept, we can go to detailed design. Um, so, let's take an example again, a, a wind turbine. So, from the design specification, we come up with uh, things like dimensions, conditions and the environment. So, we know, for instance, we want to build a, a wind turbine. Uh, we know where we want to build it, so we know the wind speed there. Uh, we kind of know what rotational velocity we probably need. We know where it's going to be built, on land or in a maritime environment. We also know the safety factors that we're going to use. And from the concept phase or the ideation phase, we have a favorite solution. Um, very often in this, in, in the case of wind turbines, it's basically uh, three wings, but it can be all kinds of things. You can put the wings horizontally, you can have all kinds of weird structures, but typically it is uh, a system like that uh, as shown on the pictures. In the detailed design phase, you start then talking about what materials are we going to use? Um, what kind of stresses are allowed in these materials? What kind of strains are allowed in the, these materials? And how are they going to fail? And on the right hand the bottom image, you see a, um, a wind turbine blade that has failed massively because of um, impact with, with, rain, with rain droplets. So here they didn't get it completely right in terms of material selection and impact resistance. Another thing, um, wind turbines are getting larger and larger. And at this moment, we are working indeed on, on the wind turbines for the next 20 to 30 years, which will be enormously much larger than current wind turbines. So you then need to start thinking about how are we making them? These wings are going to be 100 to 150 meters tall. How are you going to build that? Um, where are you going to build that? Because if you put that wind turbine somewhere on the sea, and your factory is somewhere far inland, how are you going to transport a structure that is 150 meters long? How do you ensure that it has the same and the proper quality that you need? Here you see, for instance, uh, in the top right image, um, how one of these wings or one of these blades is being made. And you can see the, the scale of these things. And you can also see what happens in terms of uh, it, when it goes terribly wrong. And that's, of course, something you want to uh, you prevent from happening at all costs. Another example, similar, a little bit similar to wind turbines, is this, this idea of design for manufacture and assembly. Um, here in London, um, this, uh, the, the, the big Ferris wheel here opposite um, the river from the House of Parliament. And this big Ferris wheel, of course, is another one of those structures that could not be transported throughout London. There's no way you could build it somewhere else and then just fly or boat it through to its location. There's simply, uh, there's not enough space on the river or you can't find a, a plane or helicopter large enough and strong enough to do that. So they had to build it on the river and then in one big operation on one day, lift the entire structure up. So, in your design then, you have to take into account the fact that you have to build it on location and you need to facilitate that. And in this case, they built the entire thing on the river. Now, manufacture is something that we um, do an awful lot here in, in Imperial. And I've just got a quick video um, of some of our students making bits. So you can see and have an idea of what we do during the day or what our students do during the day. So you see, we um, we use all kinds of machines to to make prototypes and make our own designs. 
and by that we learn from how the material how difficult it is to make something to the appropriate tolerances um, so our students get get trained by the technicians the technicians in this case are the people in the in the white um, coats and the students are the ones in the in the red or bodo colored coats and you see them they make their own things um, so here within the department we've got um, in-house faci facilities for both traditional and advanced prototype uh, prototyping so you just saw the traditional um, milling machines and and lathes um, if we need to get something that is more specialist we go to dedicated suppliers and we use those uh, and their facilities but we also have this advanced prototyping so we have things like 3d printing but also laser cutting uh, we've got cnc machining and um, the key idea here is that we teach our students how to make the prototype and then we also try to teach them how to scale this up from a single piece to mass production because once you design a product and you make one of them or you make a hundred thousand of them everything will di be different your manufacturing processes will be different um, your dimensions will probably be different your tolerances will be different materials will be different everything uh, changes when you scale up from a prototype to your mass production and then, of course, uh, once you've made it, you need to test if it's uh, working. And this is a, a nice example that I got sent um, last week. Um, we had some students building um, an electronics box for their um, for Formula students. So we've got teams of students working on developing a car. And this specific team was uh, tasked with making an electronics box. Um, so basically, the entire box that's in the car um, that holds everything that's related to electronics. And that demands were, or the requirements were, it needs to be impact resistant and it needs to be vibration resistant. So early on in the design process, process they, they did some investigations into uh, impact resistant materials. They went to the ballistics labs and uh, you can see here, they tested two materials. The first one on the left, um, not very good in, in ballistics. So you shoot a projectile at it and it goes straight through. Um, but they found better materials, so that's when a projectile hits it. Um, basically, the material cracks, but um, the projectile or the brick or the, the stone doesn't go through it, so your electronics are protected. So they chose this material and then decided to design their entire structure um, with the idea of it becoming a, an impact resistant, vibration resistant. Uh, structure. So they worked on this for um, for six or seven months, and then uh, the big moment came that they would be testing it if it was indeed vibration resistant. And that's the next video. So by this time, the um, the setup had been on a on a big shaker, and the shaker has been moving for about two minutes. Uh, it's a bit more boring, I would say. It's fine if it falls, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it falls off. Yeah. As long as it doesn't kind of pull the controller to the wrong control. It oh, oh. oh it's, it's so you see that uh, bits are starting to fall off, and then if we continue, oh no, of course, yeah, yeah. Oh, but, oh, the back really is coming apart. Uh, but no, of course, I will send you all the stuff after. Oh. 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 <laughs> so this was basically a team of students developing something, then testing it. And coming to the conclusion that everything they had worked for in about for about six months, um, well, clearly they made a, a mistake somewhere down the line. But the nice thing is, if your system goes wrong, you learn a lot from it and you can improve. And that's what they're currently working on. So they've got another three months to finish these problems. And if their product hadn't failed in this shaker test, then yeah, of course it would have been nice. But on the other hand, they were would have been sure that they had over dimensions and over engineered it. So even a failed test in this case gives us information on how to improve and how to make our design better. Another um, example of testing, what we do after we manufacture thing is, it, this is our second year um, design module. And in this example, um, the students were tasked to make an electric scooter. So they were given a scooter and they were given an electric motor and then basically told to solve it and uh, build a gearbox between the two. And you see on the left-hand side, um, 
two of our assessors basically critically assessing how good the gearbox was. But of course, that's one way of looking at it. The fun way of looking at it is to, to go and test it in real life. And I've got a little video here as well again. And the good thing here was that we um, put the camera on a team that wasn't that good. So here you see it happening. So they start and this team kicks off quite well. But here you see the others all overtaking him. And in the end, well, at least we've done a speed test and um, this team came fourth out of four. The entire idea behind all of this is um, if you do design, then it's very easy to get tangled up in some kind of problem in your in your process. And that's kind of shown by that red line. This is the way um, typically design processes go. You spend a lot of time messing about in specification and design phase, and then typically you start presenting or, or delivering something that's maybe not completely what the customer needed. And what we are trying to do by structuring it is, and by, by delivering a specification, going through concepts, then doing embodiment design, manufacture and delivery, is to streamline this, this process and basically making the design process as efficient as possible. Because, uh, and this is a really um, well-known example, I'll show that to you here. Typically what we have is, as a designer, we have customers coming to us with a question. But that customer typically describes something that is not completely what they need. In the case of a swing, here you see how a customer explained what they wanted, because a customer is not an expert in this field. So, um, however, they typically talk to a salesperson. And a salesperson will sell them something much better. At least the sales manager will promise them something amazing. But then after the sales manager passes it on to the design team, the product manager typically understands something completely different. And that's where the design team starts working on it. And you can see that the design team is designing something that is really not fit for purpose. As a result of all of that, the customer is invoiced for something that is way more expensive and, and, and completely not matching what they initially wanted. Um, and the key for the mechanical engineer design is actually to do this thing on the right hand side, to find out in the specification phase, what is it that the customer actually really needs and then decide this is what we're gonna make. So there's a real need there for the mechanical engineering designer to, to talk to the customer to solve their problem and to come up with a solution that is useful for them. So the last five minutes of this uh, lecture, I wanted to give you a, a quick taster of a final year design project. Um, this is just one of the 150 projects that we run each year. Um, this one was just very nice because it's on electric bikes. A student who's converting a, a normal push bike into a, um, an electrically uh, operated bike. And I thought it was a nice example of, of how we run students and what you could do if you if you do study here in your final year design project. Purpose of this, my final year project, is um, to build an electric motorbike. And part of that was to use a hub motor. Um, and I had to put this hub motor in a normal mountain bike frame. So this frame is only really designed for people with, pedal, uh, with pedals and um, the power of their legs and not to deal with the full power of a motor. Um, so part of accounting for that is to create another component called a torque arm, which you attach to the frame and that takes some of the force from that motor uh, to stop the frame from deforming. So the first step with any design is to really understand what's already been done um, and what the successes are with that and what, how much you can adapt that for your own reasons. So effectively what's happening is the motor, as it's trying to turn, is uh, pulling against the, uh, the torque arm, creating two pressure points. So um, the way uh, I decided to calculate that was to imagine there are two point forces each side of the, uh, the torque arm, and I came up with a minimum thickness of seven mil. Um, so once I had that, I could then put it into CAD um, or computer aided design uh, and get a sense of actually how much force it can take. So I created the shape according to the dimensions of my frame. I measured it using a, um, a micrometer 
Um, and then I fixed, so the idea is the actual tool arm will be fixed at these two points. So I set these as a uh, fixed point. And then I applied the uh, force that the actual motor should be applying in real life. And then I could run a uh, finite element analysis study. And if I animate it, you can see how it will deform as the motor uh, operates. Should be noted that this is uh, an exaggerated version of the deformation in reality. It will barely move, but just for you know this case, it's um, it's about 50 times more uh, force than it will actually apply. But it showed that the design works, and really blue is good. So any part that's green is the bit that's going to deform, but the rest of it should be absolutely fine. So once I was confident with the FEA, it then came to a question of reality checking it. So the issue I've got is that I had to design around a frame that's fairly old that also has all these kind of trick welding bits. So I had to get it sitting as flush as possible whilst different things are at different depths. And then I also had to make sure that it was strong enough that it wouldn't completely deform. So this slot here is just so I can move the actual motor in the frame if I need to and give me a bit of flexibility. Um, but you can imagine the difficulty is is I'm designing against something that already exists. So I'm having to take real measurements and have them fairly accurate. So this one's sitting slightly off. And that was what I was talking about before, where nothing's ever perfect. Um, so that's why I designed kind of two of them. So luckily, even though this one's slightly off the design, it's still able to cope because I over-designed it, if that makes sense. Um, and that's uh, often what we have to do on this course, which is there's a big difference between on paper and what you do in reality. Uh, and a kind of a good thing throughout is you learn that the hard way and I know that sounds counterintuitive but it does help you learn so by the time you're at my stage now doing your final year project you you learn these lessons already uh, and you're able to cope with it so I'm I'm saying this like I planned that it would go right um, it has in this case but it equally could have not um, but I'm in a fortunate position now where I'm able to run and get measurements and, and finish my degree <laughs> purpose of this. So um, to conclude, design is a key activity for any mechanical engineer. Um, to do that successfully, we need a solid foundation in the key subjects that mechanical engineering entails. Um, but above all that, we need the capability to integrate these subjects. To, so they're not just separate subjects, but we need to combine all of them. We need to be analytical, but we also need to have interpersonal skills because we don't do this on our own. The key thing in all of this is that we use a structured approach. Um, on the right hand side, just some examples of, of industries where our, um, our recent alumni have gone into. So they go into all kinds of traditional engineering um, uh, roles, such as energy, buildings, renewables, automotive, but they also go into fashion, they go into medicine, they go into sports engineering, they go into food engineering and biomedical, and they go into finance. Anyway, that was kind of um, what I had to say about um, mechanical engineering design. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mark, for the wonderful lecture. I've learned more about mechanical engineering than ever. So thank you so much for explaining all these design elements we have in our degree. We have loads of questions coming through from the audience. And also before we start answering the question to Mark, I just want to quickly say thank you for listening in. And also you will receive a copy recording after the session. So don't worry about that. So you will be sent a copy of this lecture recording after today so potentially in the next two days you'll receive the email to ask you to download the recording so we got some questions for you mark if that's okay so we have that's about cool. 10 minutes or so to answer those uh, so the first question is actually um about choosing the right engineering course so the students are looking at you know different engineering courses on um, in the UK, basically. So they are a little bit confused about, say, mechanical mechanical and electrical and also mechatronics. So it would be great to know your views on the sort of differences between those subjects and what things students should actually work on in this kind of, you know, different fields. So um, that's an excellent question, Jake. Um, so there are hardly any mechanical systems nowadays on the market that don't have also some kind of electrical components. And um, yeah. mechatronics is indeed a, a very interesting field that is, is well, 
it is rapidly growing. It has been rapidly growing for the past 20 years, and it's uh, things are going so fast in that field. Um, the key thing in all this is, I think you need really good mechanical engineering and really good electrical engineering, and then combine it. So if your starting point is a, a bad or a poor mechanical engineering design, and you try to solve that mm. with nice electronics, you'll never get a nice product. So you need to have a good mechanical product, and then you add good electronics and you make it work. So what that means in terms of choosing a studies, um, I would start with the thing that I, if I were a student now and had to choose, I would go for the, the topic that I would find most interesting. So choose either mechanical engineering or choose electrical engineering. And then along the line, some, somewhere in your second or third year, you can make a choice to add extra components and you add the other one. So I would, for instance, then start with a mechanical engineering degree and in my second or third year, choose electives towards electronics. And then in the fourth year, do a project on mechatronics and integrating the two. So having a solid base in one of the two is a really good idea in this case. Sure. And I understand, you know, we have this interdepartmental exchange scheme as well for students to choose, as you say, different electives. Is that quite different from, you know, universities that offer general engineering courses um, because we are more specialized in a lot of ways? Is that quite a different um, teaching approach, would you say? It is quite different. Um, although I'd like to say we are mechanical engineers, so we are almost broad by definition. So the first two years mm. of a mechanical engineering degree are um, are foundational. So um, that, that's, that's, that's the knowledge base that I was talking about. And typically after that, you will start to specialize because it is very important to get this proper base in, in mechanical engineering. And then you can always argue if it's better to do a, a background in general engineering or uh, mechanical engineering. I kind of like the compromise of mechanical engineering. It is broad, but it is also focused enough to yeah. really go into depth on the, on the mechanical side of things. And then indeed, in third year, you do a, um, an iExplore case in, in, in electronics and work with electronics students um, and helping them with their mechatronics side, side of things. Absolutely, that's really useful to know. And also another question is actually more specific about robotics. So, so you know, one kind of want to know, is robotics more related to mechanical or electronic engineering? What aspect of robotics would you say is the most relevant part of mechanical engineering? Um, <laughs> Maybe computing is more relevant. <laughs> no, no, it, uh, robotics is one of those amazing examples of, of, of mechatronics indeed that, are, that is, is really, uh, well, it is it is almost 50-50, um, or maybe even 30-30-30, mm. uh, or 33-33, because indeed you need the, uh, the mechanics, you need the electronics, but the control of these robotics is so incredibly different, difficult. If you see how um, these Boston Robotics uh, 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 bots are starting to work and how they learn, and particularly their, their self-learning ability is, is fantastic. But um, there's a lot of computational power that goes behind it. So it's a truly interdisciplinary science. And it's, I think it's hard to say, well, um, one piece of, of the puzzle is, is more important. I think you need all of them. But as a mechanical engineer, I, of course, uh, like to say that the most fun part of it is the mechanical engineering side of things. Sure, you're so right. Yeah, you can pretty much apply mechanical engineering in all different aspects of life. So yeah, absolutely. And also uh, another question, which is great, I think uh, particularly students asking about, um, you know, approaching a different situation. You know, if somebody is kind of lacking a lot of ideas, they may just you know, only able to come up with one or two. How do students sort of approach a situation when they don't have lots of ideas and but they kind of want to resolve the problem? <laughs> What's so the um, advice? That's, that's an excellent question. And very often it's not a lack of ideas. Very often it is um, a fear of um, sounding silly or sound maybe. Um, so what we very often is is we, we teach our students creative skills. We, we work with them on brainstorming and sitting in a group. And one of the things, um, what I said is that this, this idea of, of um, to come up with one brilliant idea, you need to have lots of, um, lots of ideas. 
and quite a few of those can be quite silly and use, useless actually even. Um, just coming up with ideas, but in doing it in a group and starting to talk without criticism. So someone comes up with a crazy wild idea that might trigger someone else with, in, with thinking and say, oh, hold on, that's not as silly an idea as you think it is. Maybe that could work. So we, we guide them during the process of, of brainstorming through these creative techniques um, to come up with weird and wacky ideas, but also very sensible ideas. And if as a team, you can, in 20 or 30 minutes with a team of five, you can easily come up with 50 ideas and surely one or two of those are going to be good. So I don't see a problem there. It's just basically get out Absolutely. of your shell and start talking to people. Yeah. That's right. So don't be afraid to try. So yeah, you wouldn't know unless you try. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, and another question is about the uh, sort of theoretical and versus um, practical part. So what proportion of the course is theoretical in comparison to applied skills in for this particular mechanical engineering at Imperial? Ah, at Imperial. Um, so it varies throughout the years. Uh, design is about 20% of the year in first year, second year. And then it grows to about 40% of the year in third year. Um, so it's it's a substantial part. So particularly in third year, uh, you have 60% that are the, the more um, theoretical modules, but then 40% of your time is spent on uh, working in a group, designing and solving a problem that is actually an actual problem that has been defined by a supervisor, in, typically in combination with industry, um, so yeah, 40% in, in the third year. And in fourth year, it can be, it is completely tailored to what the student wants. So if the student wants to do a final year project on design, they do that. And that's, again, up to 50% of their time. If they want to um, not do any design, but just do theory, that's also possible. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they do have the freedom to tailor the degree. Brilliant. Um, and then another student is actually asking for you know stuff like um, career aspirations. So they they kind of want to look for a job in the automotive industry, specifically car design and engineering. Would you recommend mechanical or aerospace engineering? So they're thinking especially in terms of Formula One and motorsport. What would you sort of recommend? <laughs> Without a doubt, mechanical. But that's just because I'm a mechanical engineer. Now, they, again, yeah. both both, um, both areas are very, very related, uh, interrelated. I think typically a mechanical engineer is a little bit broader, and there is much more to to automotive than only, um, let's say, wind tunnels and aero. Mm. Um, but maybe I'm now selling uh, the 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 um, the aero people a little bit short. Um, I think it doesn't matter too much because you've got your your career in your own hands. Um, so in that case, you just go for what what really interests you, knowing that mechanical engineering is a little bit broader in in uh, that sense. So aero is a little bit more focused. Sure, sure, I would agree. Yes, exactly. So if you particularly if you want to do a car design, automotive, mechanical is definitely your number one choice. Lovely, cool. Next question is actually slightly complicated, but also is about admissions. Um, so, um, so the student kind of want to know what kind of extent of self-studying they have to prepare, you know, to just stuff like um, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and stress analysis, and at A level stage at high school before they apply, so anything they kind of can do just to prepare. Um, is it worth for them sort of spending time on that before they apply to our mechanical engineering or would that be able to, for them to bridge the gap once they're here? Um, I think Linda is on the call as well. She's our admissions to tutor. So if I say anything slightly incorrectly, please interrupt Linda. Um, my personal opinion is you need to be really strong at your, um, at your A-levels. So you want to have um, our admissions criteria, I think, are A star, A star, A, or maybe even A star, A star, A star. Um, focus on that. That's your starting point. We need this solid base in mathematics and physics. The rest we can teach you. So we are the experts. Sure. We like to think we are the experts in, in mechanical engineering. So we can teach you thermal fluids. We can teach you all those things. But what it starts with is a proper base from from your school um, in 
in physics and mathematics. That's the absolute key thing. Sure, absolutely. I would agree as well. So uh, we're not expecting you to know an awful lot about, you know, all this subject knowledge, but, you know, it's okay to extend your knowledge and to show your interest, but yeah, make sure your A-level grades are sufficient for entry first. So next question is a little bit personal, uh, Mark, so students kind of want to know when uh, you were first exposed to the biological side of mechanical engineering. <laughs> when, when did you kind of sort of to know um, about it? It was actually quite late. Um, I, I, well, I, I had an interest in it when I was uh, when I was a th when I was a student, but I didn't do much about it. Um, it was actually mm -hmm. only after I finished a PhD and had a discussion with my professor, and he said, "Well, you should stay and do a have an academic career." And I basically told <laughs> him, "Well, yeah, but mechanical engineering, it's nice, but I want to do something different." And then we had basically we, the two of us had a brainstorm session, and we came up with crazy things you could do as a as a mechanical engineering uh, engineer. And we we came up with the idea that indeed in hospitals there's lots of problems with um, uh, with actually with mechanical engineering, um, and that we should try to solve that. And that was basically 20 years ago, and I've not looked back. So yeah, mm. um, quite a long in my career, but um, was a really good decision. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You are definitely in the right position for this. So we loved your lecture. So so the response is so many questions, Guy. Thank you so much for submitting your question. We may not be able to answer all questions, but do please follow up after the lecture. So we're gonna um follow up as well. So um and next question is actually for someone who's kind of Again, concerned about lacking basic foundation knowledge as a high school student to learn more about the modern engineering. Uh, so they kind of don't really want to read too many academic books, uh, but they kind of want to know more about, you know, the current affairs of mechanical engineering. What would you advise them to do? Get a work experience or? <laughs> work experience can be absolutely amazing if you do it in the correct company and that that is really hard to give advice there because it basically depends on the people so if you do a work experience where someone puts you in a corner and says listen to what's going to happen here and whatever then you don't do an awful mm -hmm. lot um, what I would really like is um, people I think what we need and what society needs is people who are really good at physics and really good at mathematics who are also capable of getting their hands dirty so fix your bike or, or, or do something like that and, and learn how that works or um, well pull things apart and try to put them back together again and, and, and analyze how that works. Um, I, I would say that's a really useful skill that um, most of the modern mechanical engineers start to miss because we like computers too much. We're sitting all the time behind computers but there are mechanical, uh, mechanical aspects. We're mechanical engineers so we should be able to get dirty hands and work in the workshop and, and play with things. I think that's that's, that's right. very important. So if I can give one advice, it would be, um, yeah, buy a bike, disassemble <laughs> it, disassemble it, see if you can, uh, can reassemble it. Or uh, one of my students actually, um, instead of buying a bike and doing all that, he got an internship indeed in a, in, at a bike making company here in the UK. and. Um, wow. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. Absolutely. And that's why when I went to see our laboratory and teaching workshops, everyone's kind of wearing some kind of gloves and, you know, getting the hands dirty on those different sort of machines and units. So it's really impressive. That's how you guys will be taught mechanical engineering when you come here. And also you mentioned the programming as well for mechanical engineering course at Imperial. Um, what sort of um, uh, proportion of programming content do you think students will be learning in this course? Ooh, um, learning typically goes quite quickly uh, because I think well we've got we've got of course foundation a foundation course in programming where we teach the basics of foundation uh, of, of programming. Mm. programming but what it's all about in the end is that we can program something that is um, useful so we like to program our own simulations that's why we program we don't program because we think program is such a fun thing to do it, it is always very applied so in first year we start with um, with programming and we teach you the basics, but then very quickly we go on using the programming skills 
in, uh, in a mechanical engineering context. So for instance, can you optimize a, let's go old school again, can you optimize a gearbox by um, doing calculations and telling me what the best um, set of gears would be um, based on a certain outcome that you want? And that can be cost, that can be efficiency, that can be noise, that can be all kinds of things. So programming is a tool, is, is a skill that we need to, um, to use. And yeah, so it's, we use it throughout um, and it starts the first year. It's very important. Lovely, brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Uh, last question before we wrap up to the webinar today. So um, students kind of deciding between material science and mechanical engineering, they really want to find out what the separation is between those two. I mean, there might be some overlaps between those material science engineering and mechanical engineering. What's the difference in your view between those two subjects? Um, material science, not that much, maybe. Uh, materials engineering, definitely. So mm. for us, the key thing is always um, how the materials behave. And of course, very often, if we then, um, if we make a structure or if we make a product and we find that the materials are not good enough, we want to improve them and we do the materials and we need to understand what happens on, on, the, on the small scale. Um, Ours, the, the big difference is indeed that for us, the typical application is the starting point, and then we dive into improving materials. Whereas material engineers sure. probably um, start with a material and make it as strong as possible, or as stiff as possible, or as light as possible, and then start thinking about possible applications. So we move somewhere in the middle. Sure. And also, do our students kind of have opportunity to work in industry during the course? And what sort of companies do we work with? Any big names you can, can let us know? <laughs> um, yes, we have about, I think, about 20 students every year doing a year in industry. And they typically do that either after their second year or after their third year. Um, and we... Well, we help them with that, of course. It's part of their degree, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, they go to they, they go to all kinds of companies. Um, I'm currently talking to a student who's coming back next year for his final year project, and he's spent a year with with the Williams Formula One team. Um, another one of my students is has been at Rolls Royce for a year. Um, do I have some other examples? So that's the two in my tutor group. Um, yeah, they go to all kinds of places. Um, big company, very often is. Excellent. Yeah, shows that how versus how our graduates are. You know, it's, it's highly sought after anyway. <laughs> so brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark, for the wonderful taste lecture session today. So that's all the questions we can answer today with the limited time we have. And thank you so much, guys, for listening to this lecture. I hope you find it insightful and informative to help you make the decision in terms of your choosing mechanical engineering as a future degree. You can continue to explore options on our website and also speak to us to find out more taste lectures. We have another one coming up as well from mechanical engineering departments. There will be another lecture uh, talking about thermal fluids. Uh, so if you do want to register, feel free to come back to join us again next week and we will have more to share. And for now, thank you so much and all the best. Bye for now. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.